Hi. Hello. Hey, Carolyn. How are you doing? I'm really good. How are you both? I am good. My name is Ismael. I'm Excellent. here in Atlanta. Nice to meet you. Hi. Lovely to meet you. I'm and Carol I'm Leandra, and I'm based in Los yeah. Angeles. Nice to meet you. Hi. Good to see you both. Thanks for having me on a bit later. I had a, a night shoot last night, so I'm a bit discombobulated. <laughs> oh, no problem. No problem. Okay, so you can hear us okay, right? Yeah. Can you hear me? If you go to your Perfect. End? Perfectly. Love your background, too. Beautiful oh, lighting. Everything. So Beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick intro, and then we can get started. So okay. starting in three, two, one. Ismail Abdusalam, BeatsBoxingMayhem.com. I am here with my illustrious co-host. You'll know her from her work on her wildly popular YouTube channel, Giandra Was Here, and also her written and video work with Black Girl Nerds, and also rolling out. I'm talking about none other than Giandra LaBeouf. Giandra, what is a good word out there in LA? It is finally sunny here. The gray has gone away temporarily. And just like this weather, power discussions are still hot in the universe and what could be coming up for the, the next season. So I'm super excited to talk to our guest today. Absolutely. So for those of you who've been watching our YouTube channels, last month we had a great interview with Kyle Vincent Terry, aka Obi. And I, I think the interview went so well that we're just moving up the criminal empire. So now we have the queen pin herself. We got to make sure we come correct. We're not trying to lose any limbs or get any new scars <laughs> on the face. So we're talking about none other than Carolyn Chikizi, Chikizi, excuse me. Carolyn, thank you so much for making time with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And you've done wonderful work in season three. And one thing I noticed is that as much as your character loomed over the entire season, I think you were only in about three or four episodes. And that kind of shows you the impact of the character. And I think a lot of that started with how she was introduced. That was such an important scene as far as establishing what to expect from Noma. Just talk about the mentality you brought to filming that scene, knowing that it was so important for your character for the rest of the season. The, f the first time you see me on screen, right? Yes. When in, in the park, yeah. Um... Well, first of all, when I got the role, I understood that in order for the character to be believable in terms of, you know, um, Tariq and the others being like, you know, having to answer to her, she had to be a badass. And I, I realized that in order to make her, give her a little bit more spice, if you will, I thought I'll add a bit of you know, she'd be a bit psychotic, baby. <laughs> so when the, um, obviously you saw the opening scene where she, she wanted her ring back and she was like willing to chop off a limb to get it. Um, I just had to really fully commit to doing that. Um, any reservations I had, I just had to let them go and be like, if you're going to do it, do it. I didn't want any cells, any rogue cells in my body to be in opposition to what the character needed to do. So I remember we we did that scene actually, it was a night shoot in Central Park. It was freezing. I think it was in February or something. It was minus something freezing. So I had all my keep warm stuff on. I had like thermals, like vests, big coat, and we were all tired. And my, you know, I had to hold the machete and my hands were frozen. Um, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. I'm going back, trying to remember it now. Being in New York, in Central Park, in the middle of winter, chopping off limbs. I was like, this is crazy. This is actually crazy. But um, yeah, I just committed to it. And um, yeah, you guys, you saw the result of that. <laughs> With, with securing the role from the version that we saw on screen version versus the version that they presented to you, how close are they together? And also up until this point, we didn't have a second strong female antagonist in the mix. So was that impressed upon you when you were trying to find who her voice was? Okay, so the first part of the question, how it was presented to me in the script it was pretty much, um, so obviously the actions you saw me doing uh, on screen, that that was written, but 
I guess the energy behind it was something that I had to bring and I had to figure it out. And I remember Brett Mahoney, um, our showrunner, he was saying that they'd had trouble finding the character. So they'd seen, um, I think, everyone who was available. They had come, had asked me to uh, read for it a few months prior, but I was in a weird state of having, it was in 2021, the pandemic had just kind of ended, people were just getting back to work. So I was still not decided if I would wanted to jump back into work or not. So I got the script, I read it, and I was like, wow, this is a lot. And I, wasn't de- I hadn't decided whether I wanted to jump back into work, so a few months later, they had, you know, reached back out and said, look, you know, we'd like, we really do want to see you for this. And that was when I decided, OK, if I'm going to go do it, I'm just going to have to really commit. So the energy of the character, I think, as I was just saying to Ishmael, was I had to fully commit to just being a badass unapologetically, um, which I think, you know, you may be able to relate uh, as a woman of colour. I typically don't commit I'm not unapologetic in life I'm very apologetic it, I'm very so oh my god please and thank you being British being black being tall you know so you don't intimidate so I just had to let all of that go you know and just be like people are going to have a strong reaction to her and I just had to be okay with that so um I would say mm, it kind of differed a bit from what is on the page so little things, so like the walk, when you see her walking into the auction hall, it wasn't, they did say she sashayed in. That was me sashaying in. And I did that because of the way the character was dressed. She had on this big fluffy coat and this black and white zebra outfit. And I thought she's gone, and the big glasses. And I was like, she's sashaying. She's not gonna just walk normally. So there were little tweaks that I made. Um, And in terms of being, um you know, there, up until that point, there'd only been one strong female character, obviously played by the incredible Mary J. Blige. Um, yeah, I was honoured to like join the ranks um, um, alongside her. And I do think that has to happen a lot more, Jandra, because honestly, when you think about badass women, you can count them on one hand, like in TV and movies. There's only, that there only allow us to be one, especially a woman of colour, only one at a time. And I applaud Ghost for saying, actually, no, we're going to have two at a time, you know? So, um, yeah, just an absolute honor to be brought on, you know, and be given this platform. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think initially we thought Noma's drive was, you know, revenge. She lost her fiance. He was killed. She wanted to ring back. She wanted to find out what happened with him. But now as we get to the end of season three, she found out that there was treachery on his part. And it makes me wonder, what do you feel is her motivation now heading into season four? Because past drug lords that we've seen, they've mostly been men and they're mostly their ambition was just power, getting more drug um, territory. But that's never been the case with Noma. So where do you think her focus is now as far as what she wants in season four? I think, as you said, initially it was the revenge, getting the ring back, how dare you, you know, Mecca was my fiance. But I think as time went on, she realized there's actually an opportunity here to make even more money. I mean, she has, she um, has, you know, in Europe, she hails from Europe and she had her whole empire out there. And she sees an opportunity now to come into the US and take over. So initially it was, you know, who's got, what's up, you know, what happened to Mecca, my ring. And then I think when she met Tariq and the crew and they were so eager to, and willing to, to, you know, to prove that they can, you know, move product. I think she thought, hang on a minute. I, you know, this isn't, this is an opportunity. So I do think it's gone from revenge to an opportunity to expand her empire in the, in you on US soil. How do you think the motivational shift is different from a person motivated by revenge versus a a person motivated by ambition? Oh, great question. Um, I think if you're motivated by revenge, your emotions are likely to have a hold on you and your choices are going to be skewed and maybe a bit irrational. I don't think if you're motivated by revenge, it's 
gonna be you be careful be, be very careful because I think in that scenario you're likely to trip and fall on your own sword um sword um or as they say you know it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies you know but I think when you're motivated by business you're more likely to have a clear head it's not as personal it's not as emotional it's just one plus one needs to equal two and yeah I think that's the difference emotion and you spoke about earlier as far as getting that motivation for the character and being willing to go to those dark places. I know sometimes actors, they kind of struggle with that when they go to that dark place to kind of pull themselves back out of it. But other times I've heard actors say they love going to that dark place. You know, it's something new and exciting for them. How was it for you going to those places with Noma, being so violent, being so visceral with her violence, not using guns a lot of times, using, you know, knives and intimate weapons like that? How was it going to those dark places with that character? Honestly, it was a lot. It was hard initially. Um, I think I may even have had nightmares. <laughs> um, just because, yeah, I'm the sort of actor as well. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to feel the emotion running through my body as I'm doing it. So I'm not just going to spout my lines. If I'm angry, I'm going to be angry internally. Every cell in my body is going to is going to feel what the character's feeling. So when you're doing that sort of acting, when it's being more channeled rather than just spoken, then you are going to, it's going to impact you. Um, so I think initially I was very sort of like, oh my goodness. And I would always <laughs> apologize to the cast profusely like after each take. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. And I'd be like, don't be silly. And I was just constantly apologizing because I felt so bad coming on to such an established show with all these this stellar cast and like shouting at everyone. You know, I was like, oh my goodness, they're gonna think who is this monster that they just cast? So it was very hard. And then I did notice, I noticed that my, my personality started to change a little bit because I'm typically quite mild mannered, very British, very, you know, apologetic and tiptoey. And I noticed I was like, just fly off the handle a bit more anyone can get it like in your face a bit more like and I'd, I'd be like oh my goodness what's happening no one's taking over me so yeah it was very um very scary initially stepping into the dark side but um we're shooting season four at the moment and I think as we go then there's more levels to Noma it's not just she doesn't just show up and sl slash people because in season three, every time Noma showed up, there was blood drawn, I think. Yeah. The first time you saw her, she chopped an arm off. The second time you saw her, she shot and killed people in, Paris, in in Italy. And the third time she slashed Obi. So I think what that has done for viewers is established in their mind that Noma is a killer. You know, and I, I do, I meet people when I'm out and about. And grown men come up to me and they say, listen, I'm scared of you. They're like, yo, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so not scary, you know, but um, it has been an adjustment to be seen in that way um, and to be okay with it. And I'm still, still adjusting to be seen as that violent killer from power. Wow. Who would have thought? In the right circumstances, that's a good problem to have, you know? <laughs> stay, stay. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I'm very intrigued then by a snapshot of what a filming day looks like. Cause I think of, of Michael and Gianni, like they're clearly homeboys on and off camera. They do, they do their thing together. And then Mary J. Blige, I imagine on a shoot day, a big superstar come in, shoot it. And she's out, you know, no hanging out. So what does a snap that, that day, the, the iconic scene of you and Obi and they're there and everybody's in the room. What does the off camera look like? Because you sound like you're a very method type of performer when you're getting ready for your, your scene. So what's the snapshot behind the camera look like before you all walk on to begin to craft this moment? Okay, so for me, um, depending on what the scenes are that day, if it's something super intense and I have a lot of dialogue, because Noam is quite chatty. So typically I'll have like big chunks of dialogue. So what I like to do is I like to um, not take myself out of it too much. So for example, if before they say action, I'm chilling with the cast and we're talking about what we watched on TV last night, what we had for dinner, 
And then when they say action, then it's very hard for me to suddenly become this psychotic noma killer. So what I tend to do, I'm probably quiet um, until after we've done it a couple of times and it's kind of set. Um, but on other days when it's not that intense, we're all just, um, we have our cast chairs in a the, in the line and we're, we're catching up. Um, we're talking, we're cracking jokes. Uh, if Meth's on set, he'll be singing, um, he'll be rapping. So you get a concert, which is, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. I get a, um, I get a concert at work. Um, he'd be doing his raps he, and he does it like off the top of his head sometimes or he's written it down. And with Mary, uh, oh my God, I'm so in awe of Mary. And I'm always like around her, like, oh my God, you're so amazing. She's probably like, oh my God, girl, like really leave me alone because I'm just so... She's just so incredible on every level, like her her beauty, her talent, and she's an absolute legend. And she just has this energy around her. She just has this, this light and she's a, an incredible scene partner. So typically I will just be, we'll just be chatting. Um, and they'll be like, quiet, please. Cause we, we you know, we, we get a bit rowdy. We um, catch up. We eat a lot. <laughs> well, I do. Um, but yeah, and I think in moments where you do need to gather yourself, you do have the opportunity to step aside and just get your lines right. But I'm rem I'm trying to remember the first day, the first time I I met, I did a scene with Mary was when you saw it, you guys saw it in Ep 10 of season three. And oh my God, I was so, I was fangirling when I saw her because I was just like, oh my God, you're a legend. And I just remember saying to myself, Caroline, pull it together. Nobody ain't got time for this. You do, you've got your scenes to do. So I just remembered collecting myself because, and my motivation was, I want to not fluff this for Mary. You know what I mean? I want to make sure that all the times I'm feeding her the lines, it's on point, you know? So I just said, okay, I'm going to really bring my A game. And, and even though I was like fangirling inside, because can you imagine, you know, you're talking to your, your a legend, some, I absolutely look up to Mary, always have. And then suddenly I've got to come and start like wagging my finger and telling her whatever. It's a very hard adjustment because every part cell in my body was like, it's Mary, it's Mary Jerry. I just wanted to be a friend. I didn't want to have to be Noma and wag my finger and slice Obi and, threaten her you know what I mean so I had I had an internal battle um but ultimately you know you're you're a professional you've got a job to do you do the work but it was internally I was like oh my god it's, I'm talking to Mary um but I think now as the more we work together I'm getting used to it now and um I'm calmer inside yeah it's fantastic that you brought that up because that's such an important scene. I think you can argue that's the most important scene of the season. You know, the two most powerful characters having a meeting of the minds there and Obi's there to witness it. The important thing I think about that scene as well is twofold is what happened with Obi, Obi being Slash, and also kind of coming into an understanding with Monet. So I have a two-part question. After that conversation, do you feel that Noma actually, I know she respects Monet, but do you feel she trusts her? And where do you feel the relationship is now with Obi? Because it can go in so many different directions now. He can be more devoted or you can start looking elsewhere. You know, do you feel like there's a permanent fracture with the relationship that you have with Obi now? Mm, okay, so the first part of the question was, does um, Noma trust Mene? Yes. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, she doesn't trust any, she doesn't even trust her own shadow, mm. Noma. Um, no, she. I think she just realizes that they have a lot in common. They have a lot. And she's actually like, you know what? If you want something done and you want it done well, you're probably, your best bet is to get a woman of color to do it. And I think, you know, Monet being the badass that she's, I think she admires her. She doesn't trust her, but she's willing to, you know, give it a try to feel it out, to see if she can deliver. Um, but trust for Noma has to be earned. She perhaps will trust you after 20 years of loyal service, but it doesn't come automatically, especially not with someone as skullduggerous as uh, Monet. 
Um, and the second part of the question, is there a permanent fracture in her relationship with Obi? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Obi having, you know, for them to have, been, have worked together so closely all these years, he has been privy to her violence and her violent tendencies, but never has it been so directed at him. Um, and I think having her do that to him has made him realize that, okay, as much as, you know, I'm her right-hand man, she would get rid of me in a heartbeat. And I think that probably would put him on guard. Um, but also as well, the reason why she did slash him was because she realized in that moment, sorry, that he hadn't given her a vital piece of information about Effie being in jail. And she realized, okay, so you're not telling me everything that I should know. So I'm going to warn you. I'm going to warn you by sl slashing you. And, it is, and by doing that, Monet also understands that I don't play and she can get it too. So she killed two birds with one stone by slashing him the way she did. Um, and yeah, I do think it's, you're gonna, guys are gonna have to see how their relationship plays out from that moment forward, because yeah, he took it like a champ, but I'm sure he's absolutely fuming. It's gonna be interesting to see what the structure is going to be, because then you have Noma, our Monet and Obi 1A and 1B, is there a, a 1A and then a 2A? So I'm curious to see how that plays out, but there is something I've always wondered, and I want your theory on this. So in that iconic scene when Brayden comes to Tariq's rescue, and it's clear uh, they have an exchange and they say, oh, Obi called me and told me it was going down. Why didn't he just text Tariq and say, hey, it's going down, get out of there. He waited till he, they, it was a point of calling Brayden. So are they, you know, what is your theory? I don't want you know to mess up your check. Yeah. What's your theory on why he called Brayden instead of just telling Tariq directly? Because I think it, it played out better in terms of suspense. If he called, then it's kind of like he called it's direct, less drama, I guess. I think it was just maybe to increase the, 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 perhaps, and how do I say this? I think the viewers in that moment felt like, oh my goodness, could Tariq possibly not make it? I think if Obi had contacted him directly, then it would have erased that, even for a split second, belief that Tariq could not make it. So I think in terms of storytelling, it was the juicier route to take. The, you know, that's my theory. Um, but there could also be the possibility that as we go into season four, there's a reason for that. Maybe that's, yeah, perhaps you guys will see that there was a reason why he didn't do that. Hey, I'll have to just that's gross. That's gross. <laughs> now, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, you're meeting guys and they'd say, oh, I'm so scared of you based on what happened with um, Noma. I wanted to kind of show you the flip side of this, which you might have experienced. I'm going to read a few tweets to you about what people have been saying about Noma. So this one is from somebody called Cake the god and he said noma is sexy as fuck okay. there's another person that said his name is aries musa noma on power is so sexy and then the last one is from an able pexit who said noma is sexy in a scary way and then there was a response from somebody that says i want her to threaten me too to be fair <laughs> so that is hilarious, but you know, there's always been guys that have been attracted to strong, powerful women. That's nothing new. But it made me think that, you know, Noma lost her spouse. You know, she's technically back on the market as she needed to be. So in your mind, let's say Noma was ready to date again, got her Tinder profile, did all that, got set up. What type of man do you envision being with someone like Noma? What would he have to have to make her happy? Okay, he would have to be equally as powerful or even more powerful than her. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, Noma's a billionaire. So he'd have to be billionaire status, first of all. So no um, bus drivers, nothing like that now. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> there's, okay, with Noma, there's, she can go either way. It's either going to be a bus driver or a billionaire. Mm. The bus driver is going to get dealt with though. 
because if she's bankrolling his entire life, the necessary respect might not be there. Whereas with a billionaire, he can like tell her what to do as well. He can take charge, not saying that, you know, because you drive a bus, you can't take charge. But typically if you're, you've got the purse strings, then you have quite a bit of the power in the home. So I think it's either going to be, because the billionaires are not easy to come by. So especially not in Noma's work, well, because she's wrapped up a bit in the, you know, the drug world. Um, it's either going to be a guy who is, is equally as powerful as she is, or someone who has zero power and but is willing to do everything she says. So the guy who's willing to do everything she says, I think would probably be someone younger than she is, um, and someone who is in awe of her so that she has, like, he does everything she says without, because Noma likes to be obeyed. She loves to be obeyed. So uh, he'd have to obey everything she says, not question it, and um, be really sexy and please her sexually. I think Noma would need to be pleased sexually in order to be with someone like that and just do be like her, her minion almost. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> so what would you say, Jandra? I said yeah. that. <laughs> it, and it's actually a great segue then for us. So as Noma, guys, calm down, not Carolyn. As Noma, Mary, fuck, kill. Tariq, Kane, and Davis McLean. Who are you going to marry? Who are you? Who is who is Noma going to marry? Who is Noma going to fuck? And who is Noma going to kill? Oh my god. Um. Oh my God. <sighs> got young, we got seasoned, we got a little cuckoo, we got it all, the whole spectrum there. Oh, bless Tariq, but she's gonna kill Tariq because she's already pissed with him. He he had it, her daughter's name in his mouth and she don't play that. So sorry, Tariq, she gonna kill. Um, and out of Kane and Davis, I think she would marry Davis because he can do all her paperwork, her legal stuff, and get her legit in the States. And she'd sleep with Kane. So was it marry, kill? Yep. yep. Yeah. So yeah. Wink. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. That's hilarious. And I want to go back also to um, your relationship with Obi. Uh, well, actually, Kyle Vincent and Terry, you know, he told me when he was on set, when he was doing his Nigerian accent, that some of the other people were like shocked that it was so good. And I want to get your opinion on it as a Nigerian woman. Did he really nail it as good as he told us he did? Just wanted to verify that. He, he hyped it up. That. He did. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I don't know if you guys are aware, but he they brought him in literally the day before we filmed the whole thing. He got the notification so last minute that he was going to be Nigerian. He, I think up until that point, he thought, he arrived on set thinking it was a bit more of a British flex. Then that's how he auditioned. And then he was told that it's going to be Nigerian. And I remember that first day filming and I remembered feeling, thinking, oh my goodness, this actor must be under so much pressure to have to switch his accent just like that. And then he did it and I thought, wow, professional, amazing. He was able, because he just locked in, he dropped in, he had the bass in his voice. And I think the first day he was still figuring it out. And for him to do what he did throughout the season, especially give it being so last minute, I think he absolutely nailed it, you know, because he wasn't, he wasn't given the um, reasonable time that you would expect to have if you were to require to use an accent other than your own. So for example, for me, if I had to be American right now, I'd be a hot mess. You guys would be like embarrassed for me if I had to just become American right now. Right. You'd be like, okay, end of interview. But um, yeah, he yeah he he did a great job, smashed it. To piggyback on that, I see a lot of interviews where they where Brits are asked to impersonate American accents. Why do you think everyone defaults to like the Southern oh. accent? It's, it's always the default. Yeah, it's easier for us. I think there are sounds that Southern Americans make um, in the South 
um, that are similar to the, the UK sounds. So we can kind of do the drawl and it's easier for us to do that. And that's our go-to. I think the general American US accent is so, so tricky to do. I grew up watching US TV shows. And when I first attempted um, American accent, I was being a valley girl. I was like, oh my God, I was a mess. I didn't even know that that wasn't normal. People were like, that's valley girl. I was like, yeah, but isn't it? And they're like, no, that you can't play a lawyer. You can't play a doctor. You can't play a politician, like sounding like a, a valley girl. So um, I think Southern is our easiest go-to. And definitely the hardest accent to do is the just the general neutral US. Um, it's tricky. And I applaud all the actors out there who do it at the drop of a hat. I mean, I, I can do it, but I definitely work on it in order to do it. I don't just flip into it. I, I have to like carefully choose, you know, study each word to make sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. And it greatly increases my prep time for learning lines. So typically I can learn anything quite quickly at this age and stage of my career, I will learn it after three attempts of going around it. But now if you put the US accent in, add an hour on top of that. So it's mm. a lot, it's a lot. So I applaud all the actors out there doing accents fearlessly. It's so tricky. Because, you, you know, your brain is, you, you have to, as an actor, you have to drop in and be the character and be free. But if you're having to listen to your voice as you're doing it to make sure you're making the right sounds, it can take you out of it. It's a tricky dance. It's really, really not easy at all. Same, same. And talking about different cultures and everything, we get a taste of that with power. But, you know, with these different books, there's always speculation that maybe power can finally go international. Maybe we can get a, a UK book or possibly UK and Africa it might be interesting. If that were to happen, you know, being that Americans were so kind of isolated, if a power book did take place and let's say the UK and Africa detailing organized crime over there, what do you feel is the main difference in the presentation from what we're used to seeing in power as far as criminals from overseas? What do you think would be the main difference that might surprise the fans? Oh, if we were to if we were to have it in the UK or, or right. yeah, the main difference. Oh, good question. Have you guys seen Top Boy? Have yeah. you, you have, yes, love that show. I have. Yeah, Top Boy, right? I think the UK crime scene, um, I find this like power, the the crime scene, the drug scene, is quite bling. I think the UK will be a lot grimier, like a lot more street. Uh, you know, because on our show, we are dressed impeccably. You know, we have the best threads imaginable. Um, and I, and by the way, I, I love that. Oh my goodness, I get to come into work and just be dressed in them. It's incredible, but I digress. But um, in the UK, I think it would be, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have as much uh, flair in that area in our, in how we present ourselves um, and how we move it would be a lot less ostentatious. But I feel like the oh. African power, the Nigeria, let's say Nigeria specifically, oh my goodness, it would be even more ostentatious than Ghost. Oh yeah, ah, okay. I'm, oh my goodness. <laughs> and I would be, it'd be incredible. There'd be private jetting everywhere, like down the road, like it'd be insane because, you know, Nigerians, they like to enjoy, they love the good life. They know how to enjoy. And um, if they've got money, they're going to spend it every which way. You know, I'll never forget, like, get it, even getting on flights um, from the UK to Nigeria, for example, or from Nigeria to the UK. And, you know, they, like, say on a British Airways flight, they have the duty free. Like, they have the, we can buy all the Le Mers and all the, you know, the creams and the perfumes and the sprays. And, like, any flight you get on that is going to Nigeria or from Nigeria, you try to buy it and they say it's all gone. They said one person purchased the entire, oh yeah. They're like one B bought the whole stock. It's all, it's all gone. And like that for me is like, okay, wow. You know, you're on a flight to Nigeria when one person has bought the entire duty free bank. So yeah, they, Nigerians, they love to enjoy. So I think it'd be a lot more ostentatious in Africa, Nigeria and a lot less ostentatious in the UK, a lot more gritty and real and grimy. Amazing, amazing. 
Uh, we'll definitely need to put in the word with Courtney Kemp, see what we can do on that front. Uh, Carolyn, I thank you so much for making time to speak with us. We're definitely looking forward to season four. Hopefully we can do it again and we'll keep our fingers crossed that it'll be not no post no postmortem, that you'll actually make it through the entire season and we can do a nice little recap like we did this one. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. The questions were great. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. The so questions much. entirely ours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jandra. Take care. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You too. Okay. Bye.